Welcome back. We're on learning module 10. We've got uh, just three left for the rest of the semester. This one is on the topic of attention. We'll talk about the attention literature and focus on something called the Stroop effect, which you may have heard of. Just as a reminder, there are no textbook chapter readings for this module. We've run out of textbook chapters. There is an optional reading that I've assigned. You can find it on Blackboard. I, I'll show it to you right now. Here it is. It's by Strayer and Drews. It's called Attention. And it's a chapter from the Handbook of Applied Cognition. Provides a really nice general overview of the field of attention. There's a lot of work that's been done in this topic and there's too much that we can cover in a few mini lectures. So go ahead and download that and read it as a supplement to what we'll be talking about today. Here is what's in store. We're talking about some general concepts in attention and some general phenomena of attention. Then we're going to zoom in to the Stroop effect and we're going to do a class experiment. So let's get started. What is attention? Here's a funny quote that I, well, a famous quote from William James. He said, everybody knows what attention is. It's a, a word we use in everyday language and um, in the context of cognitive psychology, research and attention takes on these kinds of questions. So how do we prioritize our mental resources? How do we select relevant from irrelevant information when we're doing a task? How do we focus on information? And likewise, how do we ignore information that we don't want to process? These are all issues that roughly have to do with attentional processing. There are a variety of metaphors of attention and researchers have different perspectives on the kinds of processes that might be involved in attention abilities. Here's a few of the metaphors. I think we'll just look at two of them really quickly. First of all, one idea is that attention is like a spotlight. So spotlights, um, they shine light on particular areas, say, of a stage. So we could think of attention like a spotlight. It's your cognitive spotlight. It highlights parts of your task environment and it shines extra processing resources onto the things you're trying to attend to. This is one kind of idea. Another kind of idea that's been used in the literature is a filter metaphor. And here, attention might act like a filter to block information from coming through. So for example, I've got a picture of a, a lens filter that's blocking light coming through. We've got a air conditioner filter, maybe a coffee filter. These are all real filters in the world that prevent certain kinds of um, light or air or unwanted particles going through a membrane. So potentially attention might have these kinds of properties in cognition where there's a, a way that the attention membrane blocks unwanted information from coming through. These are the sort of physical metaphors that often are found within the attention literature. Attention researchers commonly make different kinds of distinctions. Here's a major one. It's a distinction between endogenous attention and exogenous attention. Endogenous refers to internal orienting of attention uh, or potentially a voluntary decision to attend to some information and not other information. So let's say I want to look up here and see what's going on over there. You know, I, I told myself I want to do that and then I did do that. So I willed myself endogenously to look over there and see what's going on. On the other hand, we have this notion of exogenous attention. For example, 
it's possible for environmental stimuli to orient our attention. If you are walking down a street and you hear an ambulance go by or something like that, it's usually a really loud noise. It's hard to ignore. And to the extent that in external stimuli orient our attention, we think of that as an exogenous influence. This is related to a distinction between controlled versus automatic influences that we've been talking about throughout the semester. And just as a reminder, controlled influences are usually considered ones that are effortful, voluntary, deliberate, They're usually resource limited, and they can be a little bit slow compared to automatic influences, uh, which are generally effortless, they're fast, they're rapid, uh, kind of like ballistic, like a reflex, and they might even be involuntary. You might be able to do some of these automatic things without even thinking about them or intending to do those things. So when we think about, uh, we'll jump back to one of the top lines here on what is attention. How do we prioritize our mental resources and or select relevant from irrelevant information? One of the major questions in this domain of research is to think about the controlled ways people might do this and some of the automatic ways that uh, this might occur. So there's more than one way to prioritize information. Okay. In your supplemental reading, which I recommend uh, going and reading that chapter, it's posted on Blackboard, you'll see a number of different theoretical frameworks for understanding attention. And I'm not going to cover those or in the reading. Instead, I'm going to talk about this idea here by Norman and Shallis. It's called the attention to action theory. This was um, a little diagram that was put together in 1980. And uh, this is a reprint from 1982 from a paper by Shallis called Specific Impairments of Planning. And I've chosen to talk about this particular theory because it does a nice job of uh, laying out some of the themes we've been talking about throughout the, throughout the whole course this semester. And um, we can add on a role for attention and talk about it here. So let's take a look at this diagram. What we have is this notion of a perceptual system. So if we're thinking about stages of information processing, when we're out there doing stuff in the world, we've got a perceptual system and stuff's coming into that perceptual system. So we can see visual features and hear things and feel things. And um, in this theory, perceptual information feeds into something called a trigger database that feeds into this uh, contention scheduling system full of schema control units. All right. These then uh, control a motor effector system. So what's going on here? I'm going to flip back and forth between this picture and this one here. I've got a, a little meme, I guess, that I made up. We've got the the office and the guy with his red stapler. And let's think of the red stapler as a visual stimulus. All right. And I've got it saying here, pick me, pick me. Because this guy really likes that red stapler. Now, if if you were that guy sitting there with that red stapler on the desk, your perceptual system would be regist registering the features of that stapler. And in this attention to action system, the idea is that the perceptual system would uh, feed in to this trigger database that would activate schema control units, either action, um, action schemas for operating or using the particular information that you're looking at. To make this, uh, I guess, a little bit more, uh, let's see if we can come back here. All right, so the idea is when you look at the stapler, 
one thing that it might be doing is automatically activating the actions required to reach and grasp and utilize the stapler. So this is one, if, if uh, attention and action work this way, one, one way that you could look at a stapler and grab it and use it could potentially be a kind of automatic influence. In this system, the stimulus, the stapler, the stapler activates triggers to act upon the stapler and use the stapler. And these plans, uh, these plan-based units, they control your hands. So if you see a stapler, it activates a plan, an action plan in, that uh, then tells your hands to go and grab that stapler and use it. Okay, so this is a potential automatic pathway. If people have uh, triggers for individual, say, objects in their environment, then just by looking at an object in your environment, say, for example, this mouse, if, I, if it was in my environment, I'd look at it, and then I'd automatically be able to reach and use it because the stimulus is associated with action plans to use the stimulus. This is the idea in this attention to action theory. So at this sort of horizontal layer that I've been talking about so far, we're talking about ways that stimuli can automatically cause actions that are appropriate to those stimuli, to those stimuli, sorry. So where's attention here? Where's the role for attention? Well, in their theory, attention has uh, a supervisory role. There's a box up here and it's kind of above all of the action plan nodes. And the idea is um, if one layer of cognition is kind of automatically looking at stimuli and activating appropriate responses that are usually used for those stimuli, then another supervisory layer is necessary to make sure that uh, things go, stay on track. For example, maybe I see this mouse but I don't want to use it right now. This mouse is a perceptual stimulus that's causing part of my contention scheduling system to want to use the mouse, but maybe I've got different goals. And so I need to use my supervisory attention system to stop myself from automatically doing the actions for this stimulus. So I've summarized that in this picture here. If you say really like this red stapler, it might be calling out to you and activating the automatic parts of your action system, basically making your arm kind of want to reach out and grasp and use that stapler. If you don't want to do that, you would have to, according to this model, employ supervisory attention. This is sometimes called executive control. So I've got some uh, the captains of the Star Trek M Enterprise here as a symbol for this notion of uh, an overarching attentional system that can stop uh, automatic behaviors from occurring. All right, so uh, in this model we've got this basic tension between automatic influences on performance that can often be very helpful and uh, the ability to damp down those automatic actions when maybe they aren't the appropriate thing you want to be doing in the moment. So as we move forward in this lecture, we're going to talk about a few different attention tasks and some phenomena of attention. So researchers devise laboratory tasks that they assume require attentional processing, and they use measures of task performance to demonstrate various phenomena of attention and to test theories of how attention works. So just as a general idea, if you're going to propose uh, this type of attention to action theory, 
you'd want to go and find some evidence that, hey, actually, yeah, there is evidence that a visual stimulus can trigger uh, an involuntary action towards that stimulus. That would provide support for this trigger database and schema control unit idea. You'd also want to find support for the idea that people can um, modulate that, those automatic behaviors using this supervisory attentional system. So what kind of evidence would be useful for evaluating these kinds of ideas? Figuring out those issues is what happens in the attention literature. Here's three interesting, uh, well, let's see. What I was hoping to do was pro provide a bunch of different examples of attentional phenomena in this lecture. I do have a few. There's many more we could discuss, but it's a short lecture. So we're just going to talk about a few that are uh, well known. And we'll do it very briefly. So here's one, the cocktail party effect. Actually, I'm going to, I'm going to start with the second one utilization behavior. This is an interesting phenomena, and I don't have much here other than a Wikipedia link. So you can click this and go check it out. But basically, it's uh, a type of neurobehavioral phenomena that involves someone grabbing objects in view and starting the appropriate behavior associated with the object at the inappropriate time. This is basically an example of what I have in this picture. So there are certain patient populations with um, potentially um, impairments to their supervisory attention system. And if you place objects in front of them, for example, sitting in front of a table, if you, if you put a stapler or a pencil or scissors or a paperclip in front of uh, the person. Uh, there's, if, if this person exhibits utilization behavior, what they will do is seemingly automatically pick up and start using the object as if, um, even, even if they didn't want to, and it, they may even be unaware that they're doing it. This is one line of evidence that objects can activate the action plans necessary to use those objects. And if you have an impairment to this supervis supervisory attention system, you might actually uh, be more prone to automatically reaching and grasping and using objects even if you don't intend to. Some of you in everyday life may have experienced action slips where you uh, inadvertently do the wrong action on something you're trying to do. So for example, uh, what was I doing the other day? Uh, in my kitchen, I've got a cupboard and I open up that cupboard and I take out my coffee grinds that I'm gonna use for my coffee in the morning, right? And then when I'm done putting them into the coffee cup, thing or coffee maker, I put that thing back in the cupboard because that's where it goes. I don't do this every day, but every once in a while, I'll accidentally go and grab that tin of coffee and I'll walk over to the fridge and open the fridge and put it in there. It's like, why am I doing that? It doesn't go in the fridge, but I might have accidentally maybe slipped up and uh, was instead of thinking I was holding the cream that needs to go back into the fridge, I put my coffee tin back in the fridge. And so we might think of those everyday type of action slips as an example here, providing evidence that on the one hand, we have these automatic routines. And if we're not thinking about it, we're not monitoring what we're doing. Sometimes that automatic behavior can just take over and uh, control our behavior. All right, so that's the utilization behavior. These next two, the cocktail party effect and change blindness, they go back to the spotlight metaphor and the filter metaphors of attention that we we're talking about earlier. You may have heard about the cocktail party effect. This is also called 
and I'm just linking to the uh, Wikipedia page here. You could also call this selective hearing. So the ability to be, say, in a crowded room, and this is the crowded room on Wikipedia where there's a lot of people talking and it's lots of noise, but the ability of, for you to focus in on one line of conversation and hear that out from the noise seems like a kind of attentional spotlight that you're, or a, an ear light, I guess, that you're using to focus what you're listening to on particular voices. Another one is change blindness. So this one's pretty interesting. There's limitations here and attention in some sense appears to be allowing us to uh, perceive some kinds of information and sort of blocking out other kinds of information. And this can be demonstrated nicely with, with change blindness examples. I'm going to show you an example, right? Uh, wait a minute. Here it is. I'll go forward. All right. Are we? Oh, the, ch the change blindness example is messed up on the slides. I'm gonna have to fix that. I'll be right back. All right, here's the demo. I'll fix it in the slides so you can check it out here. It's called gradual change blindness. You can check it out on YouTube by typing in that title. So I'm just going to play this and let's watch this together. So you're about to see the waiting room of a science laboratory. See if you can spot the items in the room that are a little out of place. Okay. So look at this picture. Keep looking and see if you can find the weird things. I'm looking. Um, there is a weird spirally thing. That's weird, I guess. I don't know. What is that? Mm, I don't know. I'm not sure what else is really weird. Okay. So did you notice that a majority of the objects changed or moved? All right. Let's look at the first image and the last image back to back. Check that out. Is it flipping back and forth? And look how many things changed. There's a whole bunch of things that are changing here. If we go back just a little bit, I'll press, see if we can, there we go. Okay, so the lights on the Christmas tree, this ball goes away, the ceiling uh, completely disappears in part places, the, the curtains. I mean, you can go back and forth and just sort of see how many of those things did you notice changing? I think a lot of people throughout the video while we're watching it, it appears to be a static image as if nothing is changing. But what is happening very gradually is, uh, let's see if we can, it's, it's not, but well, you can kind of see here, the uh, curtains are slowly appearing into view. This ball is slowly disappearing and that just slowly happens as we kind of go through the curtain, the wall tiles or whatever in the ceiling. But as you play it, the gradual changes are so slow that you just don't register anything as being changed. And there, there's several other examples of change blindness, but they're pretty compelling. And they suggest that even though it feels like we really are attending to all of the things that we're looking at, uh, we are missing way more information than, than we might normally feel like we're missing. All right. Here's another attentional phenomenon. I don't have time to really go into these ones. I just put it here to give an example of a difference between, I guess, something like a controlled and an automatic influence in attention. There's a whole literature on visual search. If you've ever looked at one of those Where's Waldo books, you've basically done a visual search task. If you've ever tried to find anything in your house and looked around like, where is that thing? 
you've done a visual search task. So how do you look around and find things that you're looking for? This is one of the general questions that's asked in the visual search literature. What I've got here is an example of displays that are used in laboratory versions of visual search tasks. So I just, just to zoom in here, you might see just a display just like this, and you have to find the T. So there's a T and it's placed in a bunch of L's. And there's uh, 10 other L's, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So there's one target and 10 distractors. What one manipulation that has been used in this task is to increase the number of distractors. So here's a there's a T here, there's a 20 L's, there's the T. And here, where's the T? There's 30 L's now. The T's over here. Now with this manipulation of the set size or the number of distractors, what's commonly found, this is called a no pop-out condition, what's commonly found is that it takes you longer and longer to find the target as there's more and more distractors. This isn't terribly surprising. If you're scanning through the, the, all the items, then if you have to scan through more of them, it'll take you longer to find the one you're looking for. What's interesting is that there are ways to make targets pop out. For example, here's a color pop out display. The T is red here, the T is red here, and the T is red there. Again, we've got an increasing number of distractors, but what happens in the color pop out condition is that people find that target really fast because it pops out and they find it really fast and doesn't really matter how many distractors there are. I mean, in some cases you could have uh, even a more pop out effect when there's even more distractors because as there's more distractors, that target pops out even more making it easier to see. So this is a contrast between a controlled strategy for kind of looking for your target, deliberately looking around for it until you find it. That's one influence on visual search. And then another kind of influence is an exogenous influence or kind of automatic influence where certain kinds of stimuli just pop out of the background, making them very easy to see, potentially hard to ignore. So we might think here that, I don't know, uh, it's not like I'm shining my attention spotlight on this T necessarily. Up here, I might be kind of moving my attention spotlight around until I find that T. Down here, what's going on? When the T is just like shining back at me, it's just like jumping out. It almost, it's almost like, a, I don't know, it's just directly bypassing my attention filters. I can't help but see this thing. Uh, all right, we're not going to dwell too much on visual search, but there's a whole literature on this. And people are asking questions like, oh, what, what kinds of features pop out? What makes something so special that it will pop out from other things? Another very common attention task revolves around the concept of attentional cueing. So what are the consequences of attending to something? And how can we measure what attention does uh, to information processing. And this task assumes that attention is a kind of thing, like a spotlight. And if you shine that spotlight on something, there will be consequences for processing it. And the attention cueing procedure is sometimes also called a Posner cueing task. Here I've got an example of two ways in which this task could work. Typically, let me just zoom in here. You're going to be staring at a computer screen and there'll be a little plus in the middle of the screen. So you're staring at that. And then there might be two boxes, one on the left, one on the right. And what you're going to do is you're going to wait for a stimulus to appear in one of the boxes, like a star. And then you might have two buttons and you just press the right button. If the star is on the right box, press the left button the stars in the left box. 
So it's a very simple reaction time task. Uh, you might call it a two alternative voice, uh, two alternative forced choice reaction time test. So uh, with the Posner queuing procedure, one of the questions is, what would happen to performance if we oriented attention to one of these boxes and then put the star there? So we've got these cues. This one is an endogenous cue. It's a little arrow. The idea is you're sitting there, you're looking, you get an arrow that says it's pointing to the right. And so you might look over there. You might orient your attention to this right side. And if you have oriented your attention over there, what will happen? Will you be faster to detect this star? than if you had oriented your attention to the other side. So there's two major conditions in these procedures. We have a valid cue and an invalid cue. In the valid cue, the stimulus, the target, appears in the same location that the cue is pointing towards. Over here is the opposite. The, the cue points to the right side, but the target appears on the left side. Another way to do it is using, quote, exogenous cues. And in this case, you would be staring at the screen and one of the boxes would flash at you. And then the stimulus that you're looking for could appear in that same box or it could appear, um, for example, here, maybe you're looking at these two boxes and the left one flashes and then the star appears over here. I mean, invalid cue. And in, these procedures have been used to investigate what's, uh, what are the consequences of, of orienting someone's attention somewhere and then putting target information in that location or putting it somewhere else. The findings are um, not always intuitive. Here's an example using the exogenous cueing procedure. You get something called inhibition of return. And in this procedure, one of the uh, primary manipulations, besides the validity manipulation, that is whether the cue and the target are in the same or different locations. All right, I've got an, uh, a, a term here, CTOA. That stands for the cue to target stimulus onset asynchrony. What that means is how much time has passed between this part right here, when you're staring at the screen, you see the flash. On the, um, let me be consistent. So you're staring at the screen, you see one side flash, and then you're waiting some amount of time before you see a target. How long do you wait is the Q target SOA. Let's check out what happens. So these are pretty short times. We've got zero to 500 milliseconds. It's all very fast. So it's like kind of like you're watching here, you see a flash in a target. Boom, boom. If you see the flash, then the target right away within zero to about 150 milliseconds. So it's super fast. Look what happens. You are faster to respond to the target in the queued location compared to the uncued location. And this is sometimes interpreted as a facilitation effect. It's almost like the flash orients your attention to this location. That spotlight is shining there. And so when a target appears in that location, you are slightly faster to detect it and process it and press a button. If the cube flashes over here and that's where your attention is, uh, but, the, um, but then the target appears in this other location. You have to reorient your attention over here. It takes a little bit longer to get over there. So that's why well, you're a little slower for the uncued condition. Now you might think that's just what would happen regardless of the time interval, but something curious happens after about 300 milliseconds or so and it's been termed 
inhibition of return. Notice that the difference between cued and uncued flips around now. So if you put the cue here and you wait 300 milliseconds or more, now you're slower if the target appears in that location compared to a new location. And it's a bit of a puzzle. It seems like there's an advantage for your attention being somewhere with a short time interval. And uh, that advantage flips around. So these kinds of laboratory phenomena often occupy the tension of researchers and trying to figure out why this kind of thing happens. All right, that was our general overview of attention concepts and a few kind of smatterings of attentional phenomena. We're going to head now into the Stroop effect. And I think now's a good time. I'm going to pause the video. No, I'm going to stop the video. We're going to make a part two on the Stroop effect. So come back and check out that video. See you in a bit.